Good evening. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Hendersonville and to the Pastor's Bible Study. Thank you for joining me tonight. I appreciate that very much. It has been a rainy day in Hendersonville today. I don't know how it is where you are, but uh, we need some rain. It's always a good thing to have that, and it's a beautiful time of the year. Let me remind you that uh, this weekend is the time to change your clocks so uh, you can get back that hour of sleep that you lost back in the spring. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Somehow we never really get that hour of sleep back. We just uh, stay up a little bit later that Saturday night. But it is this week, so uh, make a note of that and uh, use it to your advantage, and I hope you'll join with us Sunday morning. Let's uh, spend a little time right now praying for our nation. Uh, There's been so much uh, talk about... uh, possible social upheaval following the election no matter what happens and let's just pray that down let's pray that away and we are a a uh, republic ruled by laws we vote in a democracy and and uh, we we are a civilized nation and let's pray for uh for for calmness and coolness and clear heads and and whatever happens next week and the weeks that follow that will uh that will be civil and uh, that God would continue to bless our nation. So let's, let's pray right now for that. Lord, we do thank you for your uh, goodness to us through the years of our history, and uh, you've seen us through some turbulent times before, and uh, in many ways far more turbulent than these, and we thank you for that. And You've been with your people down through the ages, through very, very difficult times. We'll study about some of that here in just a moment. And so we pray again for your blessings upon our nation. We call upon you. We look to you. We ask you to lead us as uh, those that haven't voted yet as they go to vote. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom as we make decisions. Uh, We pray that you would bless in the days and months and years ahead in our nation. Uh, we, We are thankful for our history and for our blessings. And we want to hand something to the next generation that is healthier and better than what we were handed. And so we pray that you would help us to make good decisions and to be uh, honorable in the days ahead in every way. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for the opportunity to live in a wonderful community like this. I pray right now for every person that's watching. Some are dealing with personal issues, and some are dealing with health issues. Some are dealing with relationships that are strained, and I pray for every one of those that you would bless them. I pray, Lord, for churches all across America that you would uh, help us as we seek to stand in the gap, as we seek to convey God's truth in a very turbulent period of history. I pray that you would help us to be faithful to the cause that you've given to us. I pray for, for the continued uh, search for a vaccine for COVID-19 and that uh, the day will come soon when we'll be able to move past this and uh, it, it will be something just in the rearview mirror and a part of our history. Lord, thank you now for the time that we have to open your word as we continue to study. I pray that it would be a blessing to every person who takes the time to listen tonight. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've come to the book of Ezra, so if you have your Bible and you'll go ahead and turn to that book, we finish now our overview of those six double books. I call them double books because they're first and second. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. We studied first and second Samuel verse by verse. Then we came to first and second Kings and Chronicles, and there was so much repetition. I just took all six of those and did an overview and looked at some of the characters both kings and prophets uh, out of those books that gave us an understanding and and uh, kind of an overview of what was happening in that period of time now we've closed the chapter on that and we've come to the book of Ezra now Ezra is a very important uh, period of time in the history of God's people the Israelites Uh, The nation has been taken into captivity Judah has been taken into captivity Israel, the northern kingdom, had been taken into Assyrian captivity years before. But now the Babylonians have taken over the Assyrians. And so those that had been taken into Assyrian captivity are now technically in Babylonian captivity. And Judah is about to be taken into Babylonian captivity. And what we're going to see is a period of exile. Now if I were to ask you to tell me about the exodus of the Jewish people, your mind immediately would go to Moses and 
Exodus and what happened with Pharaoh and those 400 years in Egypt and God leading his people to the promised land and the 40 years in the wilderness and Joshua crossing over the Jordan. Immediately you would think of that and you would be right. But what we have in the passage that we're about to start tonight is really a second exodus. Because over a period of about 100 years, there are going to be waves. There are three distinct waves, large waves of people. But all through the 100 years, there are tricklings of people that will leave Babylon... And they will make their way back to Jerusalem and, and, and to the promised land. And they will see uh, God's land restored and renewed. This is a great period in the history of uh, the Hebrew nation, the Hebrew people. It follows a very difficult time. It, it's interesting, isn't it, that oftentimes before we can see up, we have to hit rock bottom. And that was the case with God's people. They found themselves in captivity and uh, in, under the control of the Babylonians before they uh, were able to go back to, uh, to Jerusalem. So there are several things that I want to cover tonight just in introductory material and then we'll jump into the passage itself. Now there are six books in the Old Testament that deal with this period of time that we're talking about. There are three of the books that are historical books and there are three of the books that are prophetic books now the historical books are Ezra Nehemiah and Esther we're starting Ezra tonight when we finish we'll just move right on through these others the three prophetic books that have to do with this same period of time are the last three books of the Old Testament the book of Haggai the book of Zechariah and the book of Malachi so those six books three history three prophetic have to do with this period of time that we are studying uh, right now now why did God allow this to happen that's a good question isn't it why does God allow um, tragedy to come into a person's life why does God allow tragedy to befall a nation why does God allow things to happen today you ask that question sometimes I know you do why did God allow things to happen then well the answer to that question is that the people of God had, they had wanted, they had longed for uh, the ability to have other gods. And even before this, remember when uh, God's people demanded a king? God didn't want them to have a king. That was not his ultimate plan for them. That wasn't his perfect will for them. He wanted to be their king. He wanted them to be distinct and different from other nations. But they wanted to be like all the nations around them. So they demanded of God a king. And God finally gave them what they wanted. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you think you want. Because sometimes when God allows that to come into our life, it's not exactly all that it was cracked up to be. And it's not what we thought. Well, they they see these nations around them. And they have all these other gods and all these other things that that, that are a part of their uh, life. And, and the, the Hebrews kind of longed for that. And they wanted that. Well, God gave them for the, what, what they wanted. They wanted other gods. And God put them right in the heart of of this idolatry Babylon was the heart it was the seat of idolatry in that part of the world God not only gave them what they wanted he put them right in the heart of what it was that they seemed to be toying with and playing with so why does God allow things to happen Uh, because that's the way sin is taking us and those are the things that we want and God allows us to follow those pursuits sometimes even when it hurts in the long run so what's the result of all of that what's the result of these people doing the wrong thing going the wrong place serving these gods ultimately ending up in Babylon well the result of all of this is that they finally hit rock bottom and when they did as often happens with us they see the error of their ways they see see the result of their sin and they turn back to the Lord and they repent now I'm using a, a logo if you will for this particular study for Ezra and Nehemiah that kind of spells out Suzanne if you could put that up there thank you Ezra and Nehemiah these are the results of of what happened when when during this period of time as God's people are coming back to him they repented 
they returned, they rebuilt, and they were restored. They are repenting of their sin. They're repenting of their desire to serve these other gods. They're getting their hearts right with God. They're returning. They're, they're able to go back to their homeland and, and, and live in the promised land again. They're rebuilding the temple. God's going to allow them to rebuild the temple. They're restoring their relationship with God. They're restoring their homes. They're restoring homeland, all of those things. So this is the result of what happens when, when God's people, and that can be m- me and you, when God's people go the wrong way, and God allows that to happen. He didn't cause it to happen. He allows it to happen. And when we finally hit rock bottom and we turn back to the Lord, we begin to realize the result of what we've done, and and then good things can come out of that. Now let's talk for just a minute about the book of Ezra itself. Ezra and Nehemiah originally in the Hebrew Bible were one book. It was the book of Ezra, and it covered what we now have as two individual books, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. Now these Two books were divided uh, much later. They were divided because they cover two different things. The book of Ezra is going to deal with the rebuilding of the temple. The book of Nehemiah is going to deal with the rebuilding of the wall. And these two things are happening over a different period of time, over many, many years that pass, one under the leadership of Ezra, one under the leadership of Nehemiah. So, uh, uh, Two books that we're studying, Ezra and Nehemiah, but originally in the Hebrew Bible, they were seen as one book. Now, let's talk about the book of Ezra itself, just in kind of introductory comments about it. The book of Ezra is divided into two sections, really two very distinct sections. The first six chapters are going to cover the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, the, The last four chapters the first six chapters the rebuilding of the temple the last four chapters seven through ten really are going to deal with uh, Ezra um, restoring Ezra uh, calling the people to reform instituting reformation among the people because when Ezra got to Jerusalem He expected to find people who were happily serving the Lord and were honoring the Lord and that things were kind of like they had been before, and he didn't find that at all. These people weren't serving the Lord at all. The ones who had been taken into captivity weren't serving the Lord. The people who had been left in Jerusalem weren't serving the Lord. And Ezra was so saddened by that, his heart was so broken by that, that the last part of the book of Ezra really deals with the reform that he is going to uh, bring about. So... uh, the book of Ezra itself. Now, there are several individuals that will be important for you to understand who they are as we go through this, not only Ezra, but also the book of Nehemiah. First of all, Ezra. Who is Ezra? Well, Ezra was a priest, and uh, he had a real heart for the Lord, and, and God had put into his heart a desire to see the things of God restored in Jerusalem and throughout Israel. And so he's going to be given a great responsibility in Jerusalem, in Israel, to bring about this reform and, and, and this spiritual uh, return to the Lord that's going to restore the relationship between the Israelites, the, the Jews, and the Lord himself. So there's Ezra. Uh, a second person that's going to come into the picture right off the bat is a man named Cyrus. Cyrus is the king of Persia. Now remember... Uh, the Babylonians had taken over Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been taken over by the Assyrians. But then the Babylonians kind of absorbed the Assyrians. So the Babylonians are the, they're the big bully on the block at this particular period of time. And so when they overtook Judah, they took many of the Hebrews into exile throughout Babylon. Now, the Persians have taken over from the Babylonians. And Cyrus is one of the kings of Persia, and he's the first one that's going to be mentioned. There's another king of Persia that's going to be important in this story. His name is Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is... uh, He's particularly going to come into play, and I'll mention him more when we get over to the book of Nehemiah, because Nehemiah was the cup bearer to Artaxerxes. He was one of his servants. 
And when Artaxerxes became the king, and so you're seeing that this is going to happen over a a, a significant period of time. Cyrus has gone from being the king. Artaxerxes is the king. There were some between them. Uh, Artaxerxes is going to give Nehemiah responsibility, and he's going to go and basically be the governor of Jerusalem, and he's going to oversee the building of the wall. So Cyrus is important. Ezra is important. He's the priest. Uh, Artaxerxes is another king of Persia that comes along later. A man named Zerubbabel is going to be important in this story. Zerubbabel uh, was a Jew who was sent by Cyrus to Jerusalem to be the governor of Jerusalem. He's going to oversee the, uh, the, the authority. He's going to be the authority of Jerusalem on behalf of the Persians during this period of time. Now, Zerubbabel is actually the one who will oversee the rebuilding of the temple let me just remind you we've studied this before but I know things uh, it's easy to kind of get lost in things sometimes Uh, keep in mind there are three temples uh, that we talk about in scripture the original temple was Solomon's temple it was built about 950 BC and it lasted for about 400 years until it was destroyed in in um, 586 BC by the Babylonians Then the next temple, the second temple, is the one that we're talking about right now, and it is going to be built by Zerubbabel. And it is going to stand for almost 500 years, not quite, 450 years. It's going to be the temple until a man named Herod comes along. Now, you know the name Herod very well from the New Testament. Herod is the one who was reigning during the time of Jesus. You know about Herod. Now, Herod the Great is the one who took Zerubbabel's temple and enlarged it he enhanced it he wanted to make it even greater than Solomon's temple Herod the Great is called the Great not because he was a great man or a great leader or a great politician he was called the Great because he was a great builder he built many things all over Israel and if you go there today you'll see many things that were built at the hand of Herod the Great so Herod the Great took Zerubbabel's temple and enhanced it and enlarged it and magnified it now Zerubbabel's temple is the one that we're talking about right now for the next couple of months we're going to study the book of Ezra and it's Zerubbabel's temple that we're going to be talking about so those are the 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 primary characters that you need to know about Ezra Nehemiah, uh, Zerubbabel, Artaxerxes, Cyrus, all of those. Now that's just a little background information. Uh, I may mention some more of that as we go along in the days ahead just to help you kind of understand what's going on historically and where we are on on a time scale and those kinds of things. But with all of that being said, let's jump into the passage and maybe we'll cover the first chapter tonight, uh, Ezra uh, chapter 1. Now chapter 1 really has two sections. There is a... A proclamation that is made in the first four verses and then from chapter excuse me from verse 5 to the end of the chapter it's really just preparation for the people actually leaving going to Jerusalem making this journey and uh, starting to build the temple and all those things so let's just read the first chapter tonight and and uh, we'll we'll see how far we go uh, verse 1 in the first year of Cyrus the king of Persia The word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. Now, what's that talking about? The word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. Well, let's go look at that. Let's let's see what this is about. Let's connect some dots here. So mark your place there in Ezra 1. Just put a piece of paper or something there. And go over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25. Jeremiah 25. Now, Jeremiah is writing this uh, several years before it actually happens. As a matter of fact, the, the king that it, we're about, I'm about to read, the king that I'm about to mention of uh, Jerusalem, is uh, he's toward the, the, the king of Judah. I said Jerusalem, the king of Judah. He's toward the end of the list of 20 kings of Judah, but he's not the last king. He's not the next to the last king. As a matter of fact, there are two kings that follow after him so there is a significant period of time between when this is being written and when it actually happens so in every sense of the word this is a prophetic word so this is what it says this is what Exodus 1 excuse me Ezra 1 1 is referring to verse 1 of chapter 25 of Jeremiah this is the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah the king of Judah 
which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So this is way before Cyrus. This is way before this happened. The prophet Jeremiah spoke concerning all the people of Judah and all the residents of Jerusalem as follows. Now, I could read all of this, but rather than doing that and getting lost in it and taking that much time, just skip down to verse 11 because that gets to the heart of what, of what really deals with the book of Ezra. Verse 11. The whole land will become a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. When the 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. This is the Lord's declaration, the land of the Chaldeans for their guilt, and I will make it a ruin forever. So that's the prophetic word that Ezra 1.1 is talking about. Jeremiah had said years before that Judah was going to be overthrown, they were going to be taken into Babylonian captivity, and that that they were going to be there for 70 years. Now let me show you something else. Daniel picks up on that. Go to Daniel chapter 9. As a matter of fact, you might even write down beside Jeremiah 25, you might write Daniel chapter 9 because these two things kind of are tied together. Now Daniel came along later. Daniel is living during this time that we're talking about. And Daniel is connecting the dots. Daniel is reading what Jeremiah said. let's, Let's read what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. In the first year of Darius, who was the son of Ahasuerus, uh, was a Mede by birth, who was ruler over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So I turned my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now Daniel is going to elaborate on this a lot and I don't have time to go into what Daniel said because we're not studying Daniel right now. Maybe we'll get to that one day. We're studying Ezra but I want you to see that Jeremiah prophesied it and then Daniel came along and Daniel connected the dots. The light went off and Daniel said we're coming to the end of this. It's been 70 years. This is what Jeremiah said was going to happen, and it's exactly what has happened. Now, let me show you one other thing before we jump back over to Ezra. Uh, it, it's just amazing to me about the, the, the prophecy of the Bible. How many times does the Bible have to tell us something, and it, 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 it turns out to be accurate before we accept it? You know, the, we're coming up on Christmas here in just a few weeks, and, and uh, the, the, the Old Testament prophesies about the birth of Jesus over 300 times. There are 300 prophetic words in the Bible about the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah, and yet some people don't accept that. Well, let me show you something that Isaiah wrote. This is Isaiah chapter 44. Now, this is 150 years before it happened. So let's, let's put that into some chronology that we can identify with. That would basically be, in our American history, that would basically be someone during the Civil War. 150 years. During the Civil War, imagine if someone wrote that one day a man named Joe Biden and a man named Donald Trump would be vying for the office of the President of the United States. Now imagine if someone found that and read that and it had been written with that kind of accuracy 150 years ago. Now listen to what Isaiah wrote 150 years before it happened. This is Isaiah chapter 44 verse 24. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb says. I am the Lord who made everything, who stretched out the heavens by myself, who alone spread out the earth, who destroys the omens of the false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who confounds the wise and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the message of his servant, who fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, she will be inhabited, to the cities of Judah. They will be rebuilt. Now, they haven't been destroyed yet. They will be rebuilt, and I will restore her ruins. Who says to the depths of the sea, Be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says to Cyrus? A hundred and fifty years before Cyrus was the king of Persia, Isaiah wrote these words. How could he have known this? 
if it had not been from the hand and the heart of God, who says to Cyrus, my shepherd, he will fulfill all my pleasure and say to Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt and of the temple, its foundation will be laid. The temple hasn't been destroyed at this point. But God showed Isaiah that it would happen. The Lord says this to Cyrus, his anointed. How many times does the Bible have to give us a prophetic word before we start to understand that the Bible is truly the word of God? Well, let's go back to Ezra. I I, I chased a rabbit there, but it's my rabbit and my time, so we chased it for a little while. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. We We just looked at that. The Lord put into the mind of King Cyrus to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it into writing. The Lord put this into the heart of a pagan king. Now, never forget, God can use anybody he wants to use for his purpose and his glory. And, and, and not only do we not have to understand that, we, we don't even have to always see that, but God, however he chooses to do it, God is going to bring things out according to his ultimate plan and God will use whoever he chooses to use along the way for that to happen now that ought to cause every one of us regardless of what happens in the election next week that ought to cause every one of us to take a breath and to understand that God is on the throne and that his purpose and his plan is not going to be thwarted it doesn't matter what anyone in this world thinks God can use anyone and anything, anywhere, anytime that he chooses and he wants to bring about his ultimate plan and his ultimate purpose. And to that I say, to God be the glory. Because he is on the throne. Well, this is what Cyrus decreed in verse 2. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven. Now that's interesting to me that this pagan king acknowledged that, that Yahweh is the God of heaven. He's given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me, a pagan king. Imagine this. He has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Whoever is among his people may go and be with him, and he may go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor, wherever he lives, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock along with a free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So what Cyrus says is, you Hebrews are free to go. You have been in captivity for 70 years. Some of them never, have never known anything but captivity. You have been here for 70 years and you are now free to go. You can go home if you choose. Now notice that it was a choice. Not everyone went. I told you that over a hundred years, over 100 years, waves of people are going to go back to Judah, to Jerusalem. But they don't all go at one time. Now, why would someone not go? That's a good question. Why would someone not go? Well, there could be several reasons. Number one, it was a 900-mile journey. 900 miles is a long way for us. You know, if we're going to go 900 miles in our modern automobiles, it takes a little preparation and planning. It's not just something you hop up and do at the spur of the moment. 900 miles, that could be a three-day trip for most of us. 900 miles for them was a long journey. Some of them were old. Some of them had health issues. Some of them were afraid of the dangers that would be along the way of thieves and robbers and other things that might happen to them they were they were just uh, afraid some of them might have gotten pretty comfortable where they were living in Babylon for whatever reason some chose not to go now that reminds me that God gives us a choice you know God gives us a choice there's some people that believe that 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 God preordains predetermines who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost and if God has chosen you to be saved there's nothing you can do to keep from being saved and if God's chosen you to be lost there's nothing you can do to be saved you were born destined for hell I don't believe that I don't believe that I believe that God gives people a choice I believe God calls all people to follow him and serve him and he's put within our hearts the ability to trust him and obey him and follow him I believe that every person has the ability to do that and no one was born intended to spend eternity in hell. That is not God's will for anybody. God is not willing that any perish but all have eternal life. Now someone could ask me, well preacher, how do you believe in the sovereignty of God? And I certainly do. 
Well, how do you reconcile the sovereignty of God that all things work together for his purpose and his plan that God knows? How do you reconcile that with this choice that you believe that people have? That is one of the mysteries of God. That is something that I cannot explain, but I will tell you that I am glad that God's plan and God's power and God's purpose is bigger than my little pea-sized brain. And there are things that I just trust with the Lord, but what I know is that the Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's a choice. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's the way I see it. I'm not a chess player. I know how to play chess, but I'm not a chess player. So if I sit down with a master chess player to play a game of chess, he will let me make any move I want to make. I am free to make any move I want to make. But he knows what he's going to do even before I do what I'm going to do. He already knows, and he's going to win. There's no question about it. He's going to win. That's the way I see this thing with God. It, 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 he knows. And ultimately, it's going to come about to his purpose and his plan. But God gives every human being a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, I wanted to get to the end of the first chapter, but I see by the flashing clock that my time has run out. And uh, so I'm going to stop. I'll, next week, I'll come back. We'll pick up right there. I'll tell you a little bit about the end of chapter 1, and uh, we'll move on into chapter 2. And So for the next couple of months, we're going to be studying the book of Ezra. It's the rebuilding of the temple. Then we'll get to Nehemiah. It's the rebuilding of the wall. And all of it is, is captured during this period of time where God's people are returning from Babylonian captivity and they're coming back to the promised land, to the land of Israel. Hope you'll join me Sunday. We'll continue with our study in the book of Hebrews. We've turned the page now to the 10th chapter. It's a great passage that we're going to be studying Sunday morning. Change your clocks before you go to bed Saturday night, and I hope to see you Sunday morning. Let me lead you in another word of prayer. Father, thank you for the time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you're on the throne and that you're in control. And I pray your blessings on us the rest of this day and this week and the weeks that are ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen.